So I've uh, come out with a video already about the sanctification process, basically the gradually becoming more and more like the Lord. Um, but I haven't actually talked directly anyhow about the doctrine of sanctification. So I'm going to address that now. Shouldn't be too terribly long. Let's go for it. The doctrine of sanctification. One of the things that happens when we believe in Jesus Christ is that God, through the agency of the Holy Spirit, marks us off as being at the same time both different from the rest of the world and special to himself. The English word sanctification is based on two Latin words, sanctus, which means consecrated, holy, sacred, and facio, to make. Behind this Latin-derived word is the Greek root hag, H-A-G, if you will. The Greek adjective hagios means devoted to the gods, sacred, holy. Uh, you may have heard of the famous Basilica, Basilica Hagia Sophia, uh, now the Blue Mosque. Hagia is, yeah, holy, holy knowledge, if you will. The hog root is in turn related to the Greek verb hazomai, which means to fear, to dread, to revere. In short, things described as hog in Greek were normally under some sort of religious ban, curse, or protection. Hog. Things that were thus under divine protection. Furthermore, hog, things were different from normal, secular things. They were set apart and separate from mundane things. Both of these ideas are present in the biblical description of we Christians as sanctified. By being hog, sanctified or consecrated, the Father has, in effect, through his Holy Spirit, put his mark upon us as being different from and as being separate from the rest of the world. Sanctification, consecration, or being hog to God, thus indicates both divine protection of the believer and a positive change in status for the believer. We are no longer secular people. We are now a holy people, and God expects us to act the part. Uh, 1 Peter 1.16, quoting Leviticus 11.44, 45, 19.2, verse 7, uh, Be holy because I am holy. Straightforward. Sanctification or consecration is one aspect of our new status as Christians. This doctrine says, in effect, that we are now in fact we are in fact now holy as far as God is concerned. The word holy has been avoided until now because it carries certain unfortunate connotations today. When Peter writes here in verse two of do, 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 that is first Peter one and two, and actually verse two here, let's read it. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, though outcasts, dispersed through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, were yet selected in the foreknowledge of God the Father by means of the Holy Spirit's consecration for the obedience in and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So when Peter writes here in verse 2 that we have been elected by means of the Holy Spirit's consecration, in other words, sanctification, he is saying that God first had to separate us from the rest of the world before he could select us into his family. So we had to be drawn apart, drawn separately. The Holy Spirit accomplished our transfer into the family of God by making us holy. It is true, but biblical holiness is not what many people assume it to be. There are several points about true holiness which we should keep in mind. First part, sanctification is God's work. The initial holiness, sanctification, consecration, imparted to the believer by God the Father through the agency of the Holy Spirit, from again, 1 Peter 1-2 that we just read, is entirely God's work. We do believe in Christ, but there is no effort or merit involved in this action. The holiness we receive as a result is administered by the Holy Spirit and involves no behavior on our part whatsoever, whether good or ill. As Christians, we are holy to God. That is, he, considered, he considers us to be uniquely his own, separate from the rest of the secular world. It is not a function of our behavior. If we were not Christians but lived good lives, we would not for that reason be holy in God's sight. On the other hand, if, as Christians, our behavior should be imperfect, we are yet holy in God's sight, though we would do well to remember the principle of, of God's discipline upon his wayward sons and daughters from Hebrews 12. Um, that's specifically verses 1 through 13. So we are treated as sons and daughters, and we should act the part. And we have the ability, by walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, to enact these principles. So in no way does the fact that we can misbehave mean that we should, as some would claim that I would 
I would teach, which is ridiculous. Second part, sanctification is a process. As there are three different phases in the plan of God, phase one, salvation, phase two, time, phase three, eternity, so there are three corresponding phases to sanctification. So far, we have been discussing phase one, sanctification. On becoming Christians, we become holy to God. In other words, phase one, sanctification. After we die, we will be holy or saints forever in the presence of God. That's from Revelation 20, verse 9, and it's clear. And, and that's forever, by the way. I'm going to reiterate this. There's no such thing as rebellion in heaven or in eternity. There won't be any reason to, because everything will be awesome. In time, however, things are a bit more difficult. Here in this world, behavior is an issue. For while it is true that we become holy positionally, in other words, purely as a result of our new status as believers in Christ, entirely through the agency of God, we do not instantly lose all of our bad habits the moment we become Christians. As believers, we continue to live in the same physical bodies, and that is with sin indwelling them, Romans 7.20. And the world continues to tempt us to sin, sin. 1 John 2.15-17. It's clear. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a maybe. Phase 2 sanctification is a process whereby our behavior should parallel our spiritual growth falling in, into line with our new status in Christ as we progress. So it's not something that's going to happen overnight, unfortunately. In other words, at salvation, we are soldiers of Christ, but it takes time before we start acting like seasoned veterans. In writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1-2 specifically, Paul, in almost the exact same breath, describes them as sanctified in Christ, their position or phase one sanctification, and called to be sanctified persons, the objective given to them by God of behaving in a manner appropriate to their status. Only by continuing to grow spiritually can we hope to, to be successful in carrying out God's mandate to be holy in every sense. So it's something we have to keep working on. Third part, sanctification is internal. Perhaps the most important point to remember is that true biblical holiness or sanctification only genu genuinely occurs from the inside out. You cannot you will not affect any meaningful progress merely by attempting to change your behavior outright apart from the Word of God and spiritual growth. Those that say otherwise, you're in danger. In praying to the Father for believers, he would soon leave the world behind. Our Lord Jesus Christ asked that he sanctify or make us holy with the truth. That's John 17, 17. The only way to achieve any true progress towards holiness is through spiritual growth, which is based upon accepting, believing, and applying the truth of Scripture. See my uh, other videos on the process of sanctification and, and its application. We shall have much more to say about this. I, I actually said this in these other videos. But we should note once again at this point that the basic mechanics, uh, we should point at, forgive me, one more time. But we should note once again at the point at this point, the basic mechanics. You receive biblical truth from the Bible and orthodox Bible teaching. You believe it. You begin to apply it in your life. And as you continue this process on a regular and consistent basis, you will grow spiritually and your behavior will change. Again, see my other videos on sanctification. That's essentially describing what this is. When you are objectively and privately convicted by the Holy Spirit and by Scripture that you are, you are doing something that you should not or not doing something that you should, the more spiritually mature you have become, the more genuine and effective, not to mention long-lasting, will be the changes you make. Such changes are, are based on the truth, are best based on the truth and legitimate scriptural teaching, and far more valuable from a spiritual standpoint than any behavioral modifications originating purely from social pressure, pressure or the idiosyncratic standards of some other person or group. In other words, just because you have a list of things in your mind, that does not mean that you do not need sanctification because trying to just leave things in your flesh without walking and growing through the Spirit, it will leave you naked and you'll still end up making very poor decisions. And that brings us to the final part where we're supposed to avoid being whitewashed like the Pharisees. Our Lord called the Pharisees whitewashed sepul sepulchers, tombs, in other words, because the holiness they, exhi the holiness they exhibited was only surface holiness. They showed up to be baptized. They went to the temple and diligently per participated in all of the religious observances. They gave money and prayed convincingly in public. They felt themselves to be aloof from sin, away from sin, not sinning. But Jesus was not impressed. Not only were the Pharisees failing to exhibit true holiness, they had in fact no true faith in God at all. On the outside to the casual observer, they were white and clean. So it's like seeing, again, a clean tomb. But on the inside, they were full of all sorts of pollution. 
God is concerned with our insides. He wants our hearts to be pure. If they are, and the, and if, if we are diligent in keeping them pure by confessing our sin to him, 1 John 1, 9, and continuing to take in his holy word, keep, keep becoming more sanctified, put the word inside you, let him write it on your heart, then you can act it out by walking in the spirit. We will grow spiritually, spiritually within, and this true internal change cannot help but be made manifest in our lives as well. So the doctrine itself is pretty straightforward. It is a process. It requires a lot of faith. It requires a lot of hope, and it requires accepting the love that God gives us in his word and growing in it. So this is kind of, I guess, an addendum to my, my previous sanctification videos. But th these are things we need to grasp a hold of. There's no chance that we are going to be able to tell ourselves mentally to just avoid sin. Because unfortunately, that will eventually, if not right away, lead us to the point of pride and arrogance, which are all sin. We must do it from the inside out. We must do it by learning the word and growing in the word. And I hope you guys understand that that's, that's what I teach and that's what I believe. And that's what you should absolutely be doing. It's biblical. It's sound. It is, uh, it, is, it is part of the gift of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, and we should take every advantage to do so. Comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. I'm doing all that I can before I get to work here next week to, you know, keep, keep cranking. Hopefully, I'll be able to continue then. We'll see. That would be great, but um, I, I, can't, I can't deny that there's going to be something that gets in the way. But anyhow, um, I'm going to do what I can to keep going. Hopefully, you guys are getting something from this. And again, do let me know if there's something you want me to cover, and I will gladly do so. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll talk to you soon.